Okay, welcome back to lecture 3b of quantum computer systems. Today, we're going to use what we learned from previous lectures about quantum gates and quantum circuits and talk about useful applications. In particular, we're going to look at two examples, namely quantum teleportation and a basic quantum algorithm called bernstein fasirani algorithm. Okay, I think these are great examples where we are going to use the properties like superposition and entanglement to realize computation. So let's start with quantum teleportation. This is a technique arised from quantum communication and distributed quantum computation. But before we talk about quantum teleportation, let's clarify the assumptions about teleportation that is re regarding communication model. Suppose you want to perform computation on a system of multiple parties. The assumption here is that only certain kinds of communication across the parties are allowed or prohibited. The first assumption is that it is prohibited to send qubits between the parties of the system. In other words, no direct quantum, no direct communication of quantum information. The second assumption is that uh, non-local quantum gates are disallowed as well. In other words, you cannot perform a two qubit gate across the different parties of the system. Now, what are allowed are the things like classical communication. In other words, sending classical bits and also a certain type of resource called prior entanglement that uh, the different parties of the system are allowed to share entangled qubits prior to the computation. Now here's when quantum teleportation comes in. It turns out that with classical communication and prior entanglement, we can in fact accomplish these prohibited uh, type of communication namely sending qubits from one party to another through a process called state teleportation. And we can also accomplish non-local quantum gates through a process called gate teleportation. Now for state teleportation, I'm going to follow what I think is a very intuitive and beautiful methodology for constructing the teleportation circuit by Zhou, Lern, and Tron in the year 2000. We are going to start with a simple primitive called one-bit teleportation, where we want to send a quantum state from one qubit to another. Remember from previous lecture, that is the operation called the swap gate. So previously, we have the swap circuit where we want to uh, exchange psi1 and psi2 with this notation and this is equivalent to or implemented by three C knots. In the end we have psi2 on the top qubit and psi1 on the bottom qubits. Now if we want to accomplish sending psi2 from the bottom qubit to the top qubit then we don't care about the state of psi1 in another qubit. So let's just set it to something simple, like the zero state. If psi1 is zero, then the first C0 becomes redundant because we're controlling on the first qubit that is zero and that doesn't have any effect on the quantum state. So we can simplify the quantum circuit 
to implement the swap operation between zero and psi by two C nuts. Next, I'm going to do something that might seem strange at first, that is doing a equivalent circuit transformation. In particular, using the fact that a conjugation relation x equals eight Hadamard gate, z gate, and Hadamard gate. We will use this uh, conjugation relation on the second CNA gate, which is a, uh, equivalently a controlled X gate. So after the transformation, we end up with the following circuit. We have the first C0, and the second C0 is transformed into Hadamard gate, control Z gate, and Hadamard gate. So, uh, what is the control Z gate in its matrix representation? Well, it's just the uh, ones along the diagonal. Uh, with a minus sign on the last entry and zero elsewhere. Symmetry in this matrix. So because of this symmetry, in fact, we can show that uh, for a CNA gate, controlling on the first qubit and targeting on the second qubit is equivalent to uh, controlling the second qubit and targeting the first. So our circuit becomes this. Now remember uh, the our initial quantum state psi is on the second qubit and we have zero on the first qubit. Because these are all equivalent circuit transformation, so at the end we swap the two qubits state. So psi is in the first qubit and uh, second qubit is zero. And notice that after the CZ gate, the two qubits are disentangled. So after the CZ, every, anything happened to the second qubit does not affect the state of the first. So we can further simplify this quantum circuit to this circuit. What we did here is that we ignored the last Hadamard gate because it doesn't affect the quantum state psi in the first qubit. In fact, we can do anything to our second qubit after CZ. So let's just add a measurement. And uh, one last piece of a transformation we can do now is using the properties of uh, quantum control. Uh, in particular, if you have a controlled unitary gate, followed by a measurement on the controlling qubit, then it's equivalent to first perform the measurement and then use the measurement outcome to classically con uh, condition on the unitary transformation U. So our circuit becomes this where this circuit where the uh, bottom qubit is psi and the first qubit is zero. And at the end, we measure the second qubit and condition now the measurement outcome, we perform a Z gate so that the uh, psi is teleported to this first qubit. Now, this is what we called the Z swap teleportation circuit. For there is a, a classically controlled Z gate on the target teleport, uh, teleported qubit. Oops, uh, uh, the last step is to use the properties of quantum conditionals. Okay, so this is one of the very useful primitives that we are going to use in our final teleportation circuit. As you can see, uh, Using a CNA gate and some single qubit gates, <clears throat> we can teleport a quantum state psi from the bottom qubit to the top qubit. We can use this quantum circuit to construct more uh, quantum circuit of similar kinds. In particular, let's take a look at uh, X swap circuit. 
Remember, from the Z swap circuit, we can teleport any quantum state psi from one from the bottom to the top. So let's say our psi this time is psi prime, which is equal to Hadamard gate applied on psi. So we can teleport psi prime. What comes out on the top over here is then psi prime which is Hadamard gate applied to Okay, that is equivalent to say that we start with psi prime, we apply a Hadamard gate to transform it back to psi. So over here at this point, we have psi, and then we apply this Z-swap circuit as before, and we will arrive at psi uh, on this end. So let's apply the Hadamard gate again. So now we have psi prime. Great. So now we have a new circuit, including the Hadamard gate on both ends, that teleports psi prime to psi prime. It might seem a little redundant at this moment, but I'm going to do next is to move the Hadamard gate uh, to through the circuit to somewhere earlier. So what does it mean to move a gate through the circuit? Uh, we're going to use the property that HCH is X. Uh, equivalently, we can apply the Hadamard uh, dagger gate on both ends. So H, H dagger can cancel. So we arrive at HZ equals XH because uh, H is equivalent to H dagger. So HZ is XH, which means if you look at this part of the circuit where we apply Z gate first and then H gate second, it is equivalent to say we apply Hadamard gate first and X gate second. So equivalently, we have moved the Hadamard gate to the left of this conditional gate, but then the Z becomes an X gate. So we can do something similar to the C naught gate uh, because C naught is just a controlled X gate. Um, and now equivalently, we move the Hadamard gate through this controlled X gate which transform the controlled X gate to a controlled Z gate, and the Hadamard gate is to the left. Okay, now if we look at this part, it's a Hadamard gate on CZ and a Hadamard gate, which can be equivalently written as a C naught. And finally, this part is called the X swap circuit, which teleport psi from the bottom qubit to the top qubit. Okay, great. Now we are fin finally ready to construct the state teleportation circuit using these uh, teleportation primitives, namely the Z swap circuit on the top left and the X swap circuit on the bottom. Okay, so the overall goal here is that, uh, well, Alice has a quantum state psi and she wants to send Psi to Bob. But uh, with the assumption of a communication model, uh, Alice cannot send her qubit directly to Bob. What is allowed is prior entanglement plus classical communication. So uh, but they, it, what's not allowed as well is uh, non-local quantum gates between Alice and Bob. So let's take a look at this uh, this circuit, which is a combination of the X swap circuit and the Z swap circuit. So remember the functionalities of the swap circuits is that you can teleport the input state psi through the X swap down to the second qubit. And then the Z swap circuit 
will teleport the psi from the second qubit to the third qubit, which is our output. Now, look like after these transformations, we have teleported the state psi from the first qubit to the third qubit. Now, suppose Alice holds on to the first two qubits of this circuit, and Bob has the third. So, if we draw a line between Alice and Bob, we can see that most quantum gates uh, are not crossing this uh, line between Alice and Bob with two exceptions. The first exception is this Cena gate. This cut across A and B. Uh, and the second exception is this, con is this measurement controlled Z gate. Okay, so this classical or measurement controlled Z gate is in fact allowed because we can use the classical communication channel. In other words, uh, Alice obtained the measurement outcome and then send the measurement outcome to Bob, uh, which is just the classical bits. However, this Cena gate is prohibited. Now, remember, uh, we're allowed to use prior entanglement. And we haven't uh, used this property yet. So in order to get rid of the prohibited C naught, we can try to move this C naught forward through the circuit to some uh, earlier point in the circuit so that it belongs to part of the uh, prior entanglement creation process. So let's take a look at uh, how and if uh, we can do that. So the goal here is to move the C naught forward through the circuit. We're going to use uh, one additional fact, which is that uh, moving the C naught to the left uh, past a X gate on the controlling qubit, it is equivalent to uh, this circuit on the right hand side with an additional X gate on the second. Okay. Now this fact is uh, useful immediately because we have this X gate uh, to the left of our C naught gate. And when we move it past the X gate, it creates the X gates on the third qubit. Oh, and then uh, by the way, the <coughs> new X gate is also controlled, classically controlled by the measurement uh, because the first one is. Okay, so notice that this quantum circuit uh, use this Hadamard gate and Cena gate operated on the known zero zero state as the input. So at the end of the Hadamard gate and Cena gate, we arrive at a uh, quantum state that we have seen multiple times, namely the 1 over root 2, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. This is called the EPR pair. And we can prepare this EPR pair prior to the computation. That is why it's called uh, prior entanglement, serving as a resource for this teleportation circuit. Now Alice can hold on to the first two qubit including one of the EPR pair, and Bob holds on to the second of the EPR pair. And notice that uh, all the gates uh, subsequently have no direct quantum communication, nor are there lo non-local quantum gates. So uh, with prior entanglement and classical communication over here, between Alice and Bob, we can accomplish the task of state teleportation of quantum state psi from Alice to Bob. So this is what we call the state teleportation circuit. Okay, great. So 
one final example that I'm going to、uh, do related to teleportation is the implementation of non quant non local quantum gates use entanglement. In particular, what if we want to perform a remote SINA gate between uh, uh, Alice's qubit and Bob's qubit? We can use the same set of primitives. Uh, the x swaps and z swaps, so we can accomplish this with this following example. We start with、uh, x swap circuit and z swap circuit for Alice and Bob respectively. So this is the x swap, and this is the z swap primitive. So after this setup, psi one is teleported to the second qubit. And psi two is teleported to the third qubit. Now we want to perform a SINA gate between psi one and psi two, so we can write down the SINA operation in the quantum circuit. So at the end, we end up with a joint quantum state between Alice and Bob. Now this SINA is a non-local quantum gate because it cut across Alice and Bob. So this is prohibited, and what we can do now again is to move this C naught forward into a point earlier in the circuit, so that it is introduced、uh, as prior entanglement. Well, can we do that here? The answer is yes. And and the following circuit accomplished this exactly as I said. At the end. You will have the psi prime、uh, constructed using prior entanglement resource, the exact EPR pair, and then the entire circuit does not have non-local quantum gate between Alice and Bob. So this ability to teleport a quantum state、uh, that is sending qubit from one party to another to the system. As well as performing non-local quantum gates across subsystems、uh, through classical communication and prior entanglement, are extremely useful when it comes to distributed quantum computing、uh, architecture, or help us understand the quantum communication model. Okay, so so far、uh, we have. Seeing、uh, state teleportation and gate teleportation, I think I think these are a great example where we use the property of quantum entanglement to accomplish some useful application. And in this in these examples, the input to quantum teleportation is、uh, quantum states, and the output、uh, is another quantum state. This type of quantum algorithms, like quantum teleportation. Are a useful subroutine in a larger application,、uh, especially when we talk about classical computational tasks. Then the input and output are、uh, classical data rather than、uh, quantum states. So, before we talk about more、uh, quantum algorithms, let's clarify what kind of input models、uh, are there. We typically want to answer two questions. The first one is, what types of data are we talking about here? For example, we might have classical data. Typically, you can think of it as a, a binary、uh, string. So, like X, which is a, a m bit binary string. And other times we might be、uh, thinking about quantum data, like we did in quantum teleportation algorithm, in which case we are looking at quantum state as input or output, and this is typically、uh, written as psi, and maybe you have the coefficients of the quantum states encoding some data like this. So this is about、uh, the types of data. And、the second question,、uh, following up the first one, is how do we access those data? We could have direct access to these data, 
for example, we can use directly the binary string of classical data or directly use the quantum state as input. Oftentimes, we um, have Im only implicit access to these data, uh, sometimes in the form of uh, oracles. So, and the implementation of oracles or uh, access uh, will look different on classical or quantum data. So let's uh, make a table and clarify in each cases what these implementation would look like. Okay, so if we want to directly access the classical data, the algorithm will directly see the input string. Let me write that down again. Some input string X with N uh, bits. Whereas if you only have implicit access to uh, classical data, uh, then it's implemented with an oracle that can uh, query what the classical data is. And typically you can think of it as a, a function F. And when you query the function with input I, it will return the I fit of the data X sub I. Now, before we move on to quantum data, let's see how do we implement these access model of classical data. Ideally, if, if we want to directly see the classical data, then uh, we would like to typically be able to see each index of the string X in superposition. That is to say for direct access of classical data, we need something called quantum random access memory, which will allow you to implement a quantum state that represents the superposition of the input data string. So if you specify set of indices, I should quickly be able to use the random a quantum random access memory, construct a quantum state that store the uh, classical data X sub I, in superposition. In contrast with the implicit uh, implementation of uh, classical data, we have access to a function that uh, uh, will reveal what the classical data is. And to implement that in a quantum algorithm, it typically is implemented by invoking function f in superposition. And what that means is that you have some oracle that allow you to take a quantum state as input that stores the indices and through this oracle and output a, another quantum state with the result of the function implicitly written into the quantum state. Again, we can do that in superposition. Conceptually, these two access models are different because the direct X model require you to sort of write down the classical data in some uh, quantum RAM uh, structure, whereas the implicit access model doesn't require you to write down the whole data, but a practical implementation of a QRAM is still an open research question. That is why for most quantum algorithms, we will stick with these uh, simpler uh, implicit data access model. Now, if we don't need to worry about the uh, classical inputs or output, then we can design quantum algorithms that would take uh, data that's already a quantum state or some quantum process. For quantum data, we will have direct access to a quantum state and it can be some arbitrary quantum state psi. Other times you will not have direct access to a set of qubits that stores the input. Again, it might be uh, more implicit through a quantum process. For example, you might be given a unitary transformation U and you want to learn about the properties of the unitary transformation or evolution by uh, running these unitary transformation multiple times. In the te textbook and uh, 
notes, you will see several examples of uh, different quantum algorithm that fall into these different categories. And uh, next, we are going to talk about a quantum algorithm called bernstein Bassirani algorithm, which is a classical uh, computational task. So it has classical inputs and outputs. And we will use this uh, implicit oracle model for analysis. And we will see how to use the superposition property to solve a classical computational task. So as I said, the problem rely on the assumption of classical data and oracle access. Now the problem setting is that you're given an oracle access to a Boolean function f that takes in n bit input and uh, returns one bit output. You are also told with a promise that the function f computes the following. If you give an input x, then it will compute the inner product of s times x, where s is uh, some secret string that you want to find out what that is. And the inner product definition is in the uh, field uh, f2 to the n. So uh, in effect, it's uh, multiplying the ith bit of s with the ith bit of x modular two and sum over all the indices. So the goal here is to find the secret string s. And um, remember, the only access you have to uh, s is this function call. Okay, so in the context of this implicit access to some data, which is the secret string s, let's find out how do we solve this classically. If you have a uh, input x, with this oracle, you will get uh, fx as a result. So the best classical strategy to figure out what the n bit string s is, is to query uh, one bit at a time. So uh, for example, first time I can ask for uh, the first bit of s. So if I pass in one followed by all zero, then the result of fx, it's precisely the first bit of S and so on until we can query the last bit of S by entering all zero followed by a single one bit for X. So here we have S sub N. Now with this strategy, we will need to call the function F uh, N times. And this is the uh, classical query complexity of solving, uh, of finding S deterministically. So what about uh, using a quantum algorithm? Given a quantum oracle as shown on the right-hand side, and if you query function F with a quantum state, then the result of uh, Fx will be encoded as uh, a face on the quantum state. And this is called the face oracle. When fx is zero, it does nothing to the quantum state. If it's one, then we are adding a minus sign in front of the quantum state. And the key here is that we are allowed to pass in superposition of quantum state to the oracle, which means we can have a uh, query different x as a summation or superposition of quantum state at the same time. Okay, so now suppose we have this uh, phase oracle implemented. How do we solve the problem of finding S? Well, ideally, you want to get the oracle ready and the input you pass into the oracle is a superposition of quantum state. And the best you can do here is a uniform distribution of um, of all the input x. So we know how to write that down. It's one over square root of two to the n summation of uh, all the x in the space of zero, one to the n on the state x. Okay, so if we can do that, then the output will become one over two to the n summation of x 
with minus one to the power of fx on x. Okay, so let's complete this whole picture. How do we prepare this, this uh, ideal of uniform superposition over all possible x? Well, it's in fact as simple as a series of Hadamard gates on all qubits in the initial quantum state is the all zero state. But remember, this is a classical uh, computational task. So at the end of the day, we want to know, know what is S um, and we need to decode this quantum state to the real classical string S. And you can do that in fact with another sequence of uh, Hadamard gate followed by measurements. Okay, now let's figure out what uh, comes out of this quantum circuit. So let's mark some time step. Okay, so at first it's easy. Uh, the quantum state uh, we start with is the all zero state. So it's zero. And the second step after the Hadamard gate, we have transformed all zero to the plus state. We can rewrite that as I um, said earlier. Now, after the query, we have this quantum state. So let me write that down again. Let's use the definition of fx, which is uh, the inner product of s and x. Okay, let's rewrite this further. What it, in fact, uh, what is this quantum state? Um, now this time, let's uh, write down the quantum state bit by bit. So the quantum state can be rewritten as zero plus minus of s1 on one over square root of two tensored together of the same pattern for each qubit. So the last one is minus one to the power of Sn on one over root two. Okay, let's take a look at this pattern here. Uh, if S sub i is zero, then this red box is essentially zero plus one over root two. And this is our plus state. If S sub i is one, then we are introducing the minus sign in front of one. So this is zero minus one over root two, our favorite minus state. So the second set of Hadamard gates will subsequently transform the plus state to my to a zero state and the minus state to the one state, which remarkably reconstruct exactly S sub i. Great, so uh, looks like if we perform a sequence of measurement, we'll arrive at S1 for the first uh, measurement outcome, S2 for the second measurement, S3 for the third, and finally Sn for the last. So it looks like we can reconstruct all n bit of the secret string S with only one query to the Oracle. Now I think this uh, example, the bernstein fasirani algorithm is a, is a great example of using the property of superposition to solve some classical uh, computational task in a more efficient way than uh, any classical algorithm possibly could. Great, so this is the end of the first module of the course. In the second module, we are going to learn how to implement a different quantum circuit or algorithm in a more efficient way so that they are uh, more practical and we are able to run them on uh, real hardware. In other words, the basic principles of quantum compiling and quantum architecture. Great. See you next time.